And of course, you can't talk about marijuana without talking about to Phil McCoy. Good morning, Phil. Yeah, before we go there, though. <laughs> Whoa. Be, be, before we go there, Phil, uh, one of our comments uh, says that your shirt looks like marijuana. Uh, stems my, marijuana. Oh, you know my really shirt? Does. No, yeah, this no, is my uh, shirt. John shirts. John shirts. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Blame my wife. I don't ever buy my own shirts. So, hi, Joy. Good morning, Phil. How are you guys? You're doing well, thanks. How was your weekend? It was good. You know, we were, we're recovering from a trip to Chicago, so that was that was interesting. I'd never been there, and uh, so... Yeah, you know, I can't. I can't say that uh, I'd, I'd want to move there. But as far as big cities are goes, I, I think Chicago may have been my favorite big city that I've been to so far. What took you can't to say Chicago? I'd want to move there though. What took you there? Uh, volleyball. Uh, the youngest daughter had a national volleyball tournament there, so every year they have a national tournament, and this year it was in Chicago, so that's where we went. I think the architecture of Chicago is is absolutely stunning. I think it is one of the most beautiful cities in the country. Well, I, you know, I was kind of, uh, in a way, I guess, surprised that the. And I knew Chicago was a big city. Don't get me wrong. I'm not not that 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 uh, distant, but the, I was surprised at just the sheer size of the buildings and how big the city was. I didn't expect it to be, you know, I thought, you know, maybe you'd go into the city and it would be a half a mile long with lots of massive buildings. But my goodness, I mean, it was everywhere. You, you couldn't see the tops of most buildings most of the days that we were there because of clouds or, you know, we had some of the, the smoke coming from Canada for a little bit. But for the majority of the tops of the building, for the majority of the time we were there, you couldn't see the tops of the buildings. And I was like, man, this is just impressive the size of all these buildings and, and we did a boat tour right down the middle of it that day you could if you look straight up that day you could see the tops of the buildings and it was impressive so i'm, I'm glad i got to go but i'm also uh, I'm, I'm double as glad that i'm home i used to go to chicago all the time for work like twice a month and i always found it and this ties into radio stuff um I don't know the Chicago area. I always had a rental car. And all the traffic reports would talk to, about the Kennedy and the Eisenhower and the Loop and you know, all these different names of the roads, but none of the roads are marked with those names. So as an outsider, you had no idea which, which roads were, were crowded and which ones weren't. But I think it's a, it's, it's a very nice city. So talking about money, can we get rich this week? Uh, I don't know. And, and we, you know, we will find out. We're coming off of, and I, and I did keep my ear to to the business world while I was out watching volleyball. But you know, we're coming off of a week where we got a jobs report, and depending on who you were, you took it different ways. It didn't quite meet expectations, but it was also supportive of another Fed hike or would support a Fed hike. So that's our focus again. You know, we're back to the same old thing. Even though we've had such a good year so far, we are still focused on what the Federal Reserve is going to do. Will it be one more increase? Will it be two more increases? Is it possible that there's no more increases in that jobs report and the unemployment number was supportive of another increase? But probably more importantly this week is the CPI and the PPI that we're going to get on Wednesday. And it's a busy week on Wednesday and Thursday in conjunction with we kick off another earnings season. So as we get to the back half of this year, and it's been a tremendous year depending on how you've been invested. If you look at the three indices, you know, I, I, I think this stuff is, I, I really geek out on it. But if you look at the three indices, the NASDAQ is up just over 30%, and the S&P right in the middle of that, and the Dow at about 15 16%, I believe. And the Dow's barely up. You know, the Dow has barely done much at all. And we've always, you know, we, we try to push people and say, look, stop paying so much attention to the Dow. If you want to look at a gauge for how your equity portion of your portfolio should be doing, it's the S&P. It's not the Dow. And maybe even the NASDAQ in front of the Dow is just because of this, the, how many companies are in each indice. But, man, there's a wide range of how they perform. While well, the NASDAQ's up almost 30 and the Dow's barely, I only think the Dow's cracked 2% yet so far this year. And the S&P's kind of right in the middle. So it's, it's been a really good year. But can we hold on to it? And are we really at the end of the Fed tightening and, 
increasing rates and it, even still you know it's not it shouldn't be as drastic as what it was last year you remember the three quarters of a percent increases that we got multiple times last year even if something is supportive whether it's C- cpi ppi jobs report whatever it is even if it's supportive it's not going to be three quarters of a percent i cer- certainly hope not anyway so we'll get that information today and it will help us gauge what we think the federal reserve will do for the remainder of the year will it be one two will it, could it be possibly zero we don't really know and they've left that open for interpretation they had said that they anticipate two more. That doesn't mean they will, that they anticipate two more rate increases, and it's going to be data-driven. They've said that all along. So as we get this data in, it will help us determine whether what we think they're going to do. And we get that information this week, very, very important information this week. Phil, you use the magic word anticipate. For the last two or three years, we've been anticipating a recession, anticipating a recession. Recently, though, several economists have backed off from that and said we may very well avoid a recession. Is, do you see in any, in, with that shift in, uh, in thinking, are you seeing any change in the market investment? No, you know, and we've said this before, it is really interesting to see the impact of a recession on our markets. And, you know, because of the anatomy of a recession, how does it work? When is it announced? And and we have to keep in mind that once a recession is declared, they go back and give it a start date. So it's really hard to say, well, how did our markets perform during a recession? What do you mean from the time that they declared the recession or from the time that we said, hey, this is when the recession actually began and to the end. So there's a couple sets of numbers. So during a recession, the breadth of it, and this is including when we go back and give it that start date, markets perform poorly, of course. The S&P is down about 20%. But from the time a recession is declared and moving forward to the end of the recession, the market actually reacts positively. So as far as the markets are concerned, other than a short period of time, I don't know that I'm too overly concerned. This is my blinders on and only looking at market performance. Keep that in mind that if they say, hey, we're in a recession, and and we're nowhere near that because of our jobs market. Be clear, our jobs market is way too strong for them to declare a recession, and that's where the optimism is coming from. It says, hey, maybe we can we can have this soft landing that the Fed's trying to produce without entering the, the labor market too bad. But from a market standpoint only, if they say, hey, we're, we, we declare a recession now, I don't want to pick a date, November of this year, we declare a recession and moving forward, I would kind of, from a market standpoint, it may make me a little bit more bullish because that's just a declaration that we're nearing the end of this trough and this cycle and looking at the economic cycle we know what's next during that period which is an increase in our markets go up and look and it's a small example and it's an exaggerated example but look back to april of 2020 where we were in a recession but man the market performance that we had gotten during that period and that's part of covid and that's not it's not exactly the norm because of the the inclusion of COVID, but during April of 2020 and May of 2020, our markets had done exceedingly well. And, and I mean, it shocks, still shocks me looking back at it. It still shocks me. And that was after a recession was announced and, and our markets had done really well. Now, that was also, I think, the shortest recession we'd ever had. And because of the um, uh, the, the government assistance and the, and the PPP loans and all, all of that stuff that we're still dealing with today, that's why the Federal Reserve is forced to increase rates right now because of all these assistance that we that we, right right or wrong doesn't matter what that we needed back in 2020 to keep our economy afloat with that made us run too hot and now they're trying to cool us off but from that time that the recession was announced in april 2020 and it, it, it is a good case study our markets did really well so from that standpoint i don't really fear it in you know a, a, the declaration of a, a recession i don't really i prefer that we don't but I don't really fear it because of that. Go ahead. Phil, historically, you know, over the course of the last 40 years, we've talked about this before, I've, I've seen interest rates uh, as high as 13 15% and uh, inflation rate that was sort of reflecting that. And then I've seen just recently almost essentially zero. Historically, these fluctuations, the drops in inflation and in, in, uh, inflation rates and interest rates, 
have they historically been engineered by the Fed, or are they sort of organic to the cycles of the economy? Well, they're, no, the, uh, the inflation is somewhat organic. Uh, to the cycles of the economy. You know, as our economy runs hot and our demand outweighs our supply, of course, inflation goes up. But what the Federal Reserve does is engineered, because, but it's in reaction to inflation. So what they, what, and, and that's just, that's as simple as you can put it, is what they're try, attempting to do is slow down the consumer when they increase rates and pull money off the books. They're trying to slow us down, make it more difficult for us to purchase things, especially like vehicles and homes and those that live off credit cards. Well, it's not as attractive if you're paying 28% interest rate on credit card. You shouldn't be doing that anyway, regardless of what rates are, but it's not as it's not as attractive and it makes it a little bit more difficult to do. Even the adjustable rate loans with home equity loans and any of your credit cards are adjustable rate for the most part as well. So if you had a minimum payment or I must pay three hundred dollars a month on my credit card will or rates go up, that's going to sh that those rates are also going to increase as well. So it slows the consumer down to a point and allows supply to catch up with demand, but it takes a while for that to happen. That's why you, you have these this hard landing, soft landing sort of discussion. It takes a while for that to make its way through <clears throat> through our economy. The last leg of it is the employment market. As we slow the consumer down, we don't need to be making these goods and doing these services as much because consumers aren't spending as much or, or spending as, as or actively buying and selling our goods. And I didn't see that in Chicago this week. That's certainly a, a, a minor example, but boy, people didn't seem to really care about the cost of things in Chicago this weekend. But the as, as that happens, we don't need those type. We don't need as many employees. And then you see layoffs, and that's kind of the last leg of it. But it does take a while to work its way through, which is why the Federal Reserve has slowed, and we haven't got in, gotten our inflation down really anywhere near where it needs to be yet. There's still this sticky part of inflation that remains, but they've slowed down and, and paused just for a moment, maybe long, hopefully longer, but just for a moment to see what the outcome what will be or what it could look like from what they've done in the past so it takes a while for that to work its way through but to answer your question the inflation part is mostly organic but the interest rate part is manufactured phil i know in the past you've stayed away from politics uh in your uh in your discussion in the segment it appears though more and more that uh president biden is going to be running on economics and his Biden economic program, he's uh, he's he's espoused and has been a very successful. Well, the unemployment uh, is down, the uh, new jobs growth, uh, inflation is not as high as it was, it was before. How much of this do you think will be effective as we go into the next political cycle? I, I don't know. You know, all the things that someone could run off of and it, it whether it, it doesn't matter if it was right now or four years ago you could there, it depends on the side of the fence you stand on you know, i can make you know i use a football analogy you can make stats say anything that you want them to say and i could make ben roethlisberger look like the best quarterback in the world if i just pick out the stats that i want to pick out and of course he, he wasn't he was a good one but he wasn't the best ever but you, you can take those stats and, and angle them to to support the argument that you want to make. On one hand, you could say, go oh, look how many jobs we've created. Well, yeah, but on the other hand, you could say, well, look how many jobs we lost because of COVID. You know, that was kind of, you just kind of walked into that. And both of those would be accurate. Neither, neither one of those are not accurate. They're both accurate. On one hand, you could say, well, yeah, look at the inflation, how much it's come down over the past year, year and a half, and it's accurate. It has. But on the other hand, you could then say, but yeah, but some of your policies caused a lot of this inflation. Well, that could be accurate as well, but it doesn't mean either statement is wrong. So as far as whether or not it helps or hurts, I, I think it just really, if, if you were supportive of his economic policy, well, it's going to continue to support it. If you were not supportive of it, well, then you'll, you'll point to the, to, to the factors that I had just mentioned before and use that to support your arguments. I don't know that it would help or hurt him from that standpoint. However, on the surface, you know, if you just wanted to say, what does our employment market look like right now in a vacuum? It does. It looks really good in a vacuum. Wages are up, and, and at the moment, that may not be a great thing. And Some people don't like when I say that, but it is true. That's part of this sticky inflation 
is wage inflation. And the JOLT report that about three years ago, actually, Rob, I'll give him credit, really educated me on the JOLT report because I didn't really, I never paid much attention to it. But then when you know, I heard Rob was talking about it, I was like, you know what, that's a really, really important gauge as far as how our economy is going because it shows the direction of wages, and that's a job opening and labor turnover. And if you're leaving, if I'm making a lateral move to, from making 18 bucks an hour to 22 bucks an hour, well, that's wage inflation. And you're making a lateral move, but you're making more money. And that jolt report remains heavy right now. In a vacuum, that's a good thing. And if you're someone that benefits from making more money because of the current environment we're in for your family and your household and, and your savings or whatever it is that you're doing, that's a good thing, but for the battle against inflation, it's not because of that all plays into it, all plays a role into how much things cost, how much human capital, how much do I have to, to pay these humans to produce or to do whatever it is I need them to do ultimately makes its way to our goods and, and services that we're paying for, which is inflation. So that, that you know that's the, the other side of the coin where you, you could, you could argue in a vacuum, the employment market looks really good right now, and it's even to the point where you have, you have a hard time finding people to work. You know, walk into I saw that this in in Chicago, you'd walk into a store. We're in Lowe's. I had to go to Lowe's this weekend, and, and it wasn't that they, the workers weren't working hard; they were. They didn't have enough, and you know, we're standing here looking for a door, and we can't find anyone because still financial fields, financial field is not measurement field. And I measured the door wrong, and I couldn't find anyone. Just like, hey man, can you decipher what? my dumb butt measured here before I left and couldn't find anyone. It took forever. I hit that button. I hit that button and we had just had to walk around. We couldn't find anyone. And it's simply because they don't have enough workers. So in order to entice people to come in, you end up paying them more. And eventually that will make its way to that door that I was looking for. It's going to make its way to it. And that door is going to be more expensive. So that's part of this sticky wage inflation that the Federal Reserve and why that strong number now it, it kind of <clears throat> the the new jobs didn't really meet expectations but the wages had gone up and the unemployment number had gone down so that that mixture was supportive of, of, of interest rate hikes but that's why the Federal Reserve looks at that those jobs numbers and the employment numbers and it helps them determine what they're going to do next because the stronger the job market the more likely they are to continue increasing rates so if people are making more money, and clearly they're spending more money, because I agree, I, I don't perceive or I don't observe restaurants are full. Um, we went to one of the shows at the CATF this, this weekend. It was packed. Um, so if, if people are comfortable and they're spending money and the economy is chugging along and unemployment is low, maybe we just need to reassess our evaluation of what good inflation is. You know, rather than creating the crisis, is what? Where am I missing philosophically? Not, and, and I think we we're both in. A, we had talked about this maybe like three or four weeks ago, John. You had mentioned like why this target of two percent, which we envisioned as a healthy inflation. Inflation is healthy, just like kind of like stress is healthy for us. Just a little bit of it, though, um, and and that's the same thing with inflation, where that target right at two percent. Where I do wonder, it's like, hey, why don't we just move the target? Let's move. If we can't get it from three to two, for example, or from four to two or whatever, if we can't get it there, why don't we just move the target? If everything else looks good and we're not going into a recession and the labor market looks good, why cause more damage if we can, let's just move, let's just change the target, just move the target. It's not that big of a deal. Move it well, and it could be a big deal, but let's just move the target. And, and I do wonder if that's not the ultimate outcome so where we, we can move the target so we can stop increasing rates, leave a he somewhat healthy labor market intact, and not cause a recession. I don't disagree at all. Is it possible that there is – we talk about corrections uh, in, in the various markets. You know, we get a – a market correction drops 10% or whatever the hell it is. And is it possible that there's such a thing exists that after a decade or more of essentially 0% inflation, half a point here and there, that this is just an adjustment to, to bring us back to where we would have been otherwise? Uh, yeah, and, that, and that's another strong point that you make and another uh, point to the argument where if you said, why the target of 2%, why can't we be at 25 or 3%, that's also supportive of that because when you look over the long haul, you're right. 
We've had very little to do with inflation. I mean, we, heck, we went through a period where we wanted more inflation. We're kind of begging for it. We want to get inflation up to 2 or 2.2, I think, was the number under Trump. We're trying to get that number up to that so we don't fall into this cycle of deflation, which is even more dangerous than inflation because it's harder to stop. But you're, you're, you're right in the fact that, you know, we go a decade or so with almost – no overall inflation. Now, you know, you could argue that. We say, well, a decade ago, my eggs cost this or my milk cost that. There's the food and energy inflation. And there's all these inflation gauges that strip out the more volatile pieces like gas and or energy and food because they're, sometimes they're controlled by other factors. It's not purely inflation. So you have the core inflation and then you then you have this the stripped out version but uh, but that that does support this idea that hey why don't we just change the target a little bit we don't even have to be drastic why don't we just change the target from two percent which it is right now to two and a half or three and and i'm sure there's some sort of you know there's some sort of uh issues that could arise from that but i failed to see them too i thought that last year I was like why is the target so daggone low you know anytime we run in our financial planning software, we don't use two percent. We never use two percent. You know, when we when we're ex, 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 exacerbating things out into the future, we're using different um, inflation models for you know for long term care. We use more. We use like six percent for overall cost of living. I think it's three and a half percent, even though the target is two percent. So you know, but why this two this overall two percent? I, I don't disagree with you at all, and I'm sure there's an economist somewhere. Because that's not—I'm not an economist. I'm sure there's one somewhere that says, "Phil, you're an idiot. You can't do that." And this is why, and I wouldn't debate them. But at the moment, I don't—I don't see why you couldn't change that if it would keep us out of recession. I think we got the answer, Dylan. Could, or, or, uh, Colin, could you get Janet Yellen on the phone for us, please? Um, <laughs> she's in China. And, she's in China oh, right she now. China? Yeah. Well, okay, it's time difference. <laughs> she's in China, different time zone. <laughs> So, all right. Well, Phil, if people want to get in touch with you, what do they do? Uh, they can call us or reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us within the appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. 